Okay, I think it's time to start. Yeah. Everyone, a warm welcome to our seminar on that afterlife and reincarnation. Uh, we started these seminars three months ago, and this is the first seminar that we are now running in a hybrid mode, both in person and online. After so many years of not, you know, uh, having an in-person event, it is just wonderful to see so many uh, faces in person, and also to be able to reach our participants. Many of them are actually coming, joining us from different countries. Um, so a warm welcome to you all. Uh, as we start, uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we operate, uh, I, and I want to pay my respect um, to the elders past, present, and emerging. Um, today's topic is um, classical Jewish thought and metampsychosis. Um, rather than the speaker himself, I will introduce our host for today, uh, Emeritus Professor uh, Constant Mews. Um, so, Professor Muse uh, uh, is a leading authority on medieval Christianity, and he has published significantly on interfaith dialogue as well. Um, he has played a foundational role in the development of the studies here at Monash. Uh, he has been my personal mentor and teacher, so for many people, I guess, in Monash. Um, as an acknowledgement of his services in religious studies, um, in 2005, he was awarded the Australian Academy of the Humanities Fellowship, the highly distinguished honor in Australia. Um, he is still very active in terms of research. His recent publications include um, or, or, or extend to topics uh, not just on Christian theology, but also on music and dance, um, theories of justice and issues of injustice and body politics. Uh, specifically within the, within the medieval Christian world. And I think that he will be giving us a talk on Christianity and reincarnation in a few months. So he will be one of our forthcoming speakers. Um, he is also the president of the Religious Studies of Religious Association, sorry, his, Religious History Association um, as well. So yeah, thank you for being the host of today's meeting, Dear Constant. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. But I'm only just the, the warm up back to the real thing. But I have to say, that it is a, a huge honor for me to be here, particularly in person as well as uh, virtually. Um, I was director of a center for religious studies for a long time, and then I retired at uh, 21. And it was, yeah, the, the, for institutional reasons that the, the, that center for religious studies was not continued. But um, we did, I did insist on a creative, on, in the separation of the creation of a network for religious studies. And this is really what I'm seeing taking place with this. So it's a, a huge background, a huge uh, privilege for me to be sharing this with you. Enough about me, but I really want to introduce Dr. Ruff Daskalou, that we, one of the great things that we have here in Monash, certainly when I was there, and this is still going, we have a real multi-religious interest in mystical experience. And, and everyone has a skill that they can bring to this. And part of that group, that cluster of researchers that we have is Dr. Raf Dusklu, who's born and raised in Sydney, completed his MA in Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, his PhD in the History of Judaism at Chicago. And his research focuses on Jewish intellectual culture, exegesis, philosophy, science, and mysticism in the late medieval period with a focus on the reception of Islamic thought among the Jews. So Raf is currently an adjunct research associate at Monash and coordinator of the Jewish Muslim Forum at Monash. I didn't actually know about that. Um, the, Raf is the author of two books. One of them, uh, A Philosopher of Scripture, was published in 2019 by Brill, provides an intellectual portrait of someone I've heard him speak about, Tahun Ayyar Shalmi, a 13th century um, Jewish linguist and philologist, philosopher and mystic. They were all, all rounders in those days. The book won the prestigious Blumenthal Prize in Medieval Jewish Studies in 2022. I didn't know that. Congratulations. His second book was published in 2017 by the Karai Press and presents an edition, analysis, and translation of a medieval Judeo Arabic Karai creed. Well, the title of Raf's talk today is A Debate Spanning Centuries Metempsychosis in Classical Jewish Thought. He'll deliver a 40 minute talk, which will be followed by a question and answer session with Raf. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Constant. 
Um, I'm go I, this is an unusual way to begin. I am brand new to wearing glasses and I've forgotten to remove, remove them from my bag. So I'm going to remove them from my bag. <laughs> Sorry, I'm untrained, yes. and um, and I, and um, had a serendipitous experience this morning, which I think is an interesting segue into the topic. This morning, I was in a Hasidic synagogue, and it is the practice in in this particular community to read uh, to read a daily teaching, uh, a daily Hasidic teaching. And in this particular synagogue, after that teaching, after the prayers, to read a teaching on, you know, publicly on a topic of messianic, connected to messianic redemption. And the selection this morning was uh, an interesting question. On the one hand, we know that there is reincarnation. On the other hand, there is re resurrection of the dead. Apparently, this seems to be in tension, because if the same soul is born in many bodies, what's resurrected? Which one is resurrected? So it turns out that this question is asked, and this is how it was presented, it's asked of the poskim, of the legal decisors. So the, the rabbi delivering it said, obviously, I'm not going to decide. So this is as if it's a legal decision to be made. So how is this going to pan out? Is, um, is it almost a legal decision? And he says, however, their latest spiritual leader, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who died in 1994, at least according to most people, <laughs> the, he, um, he uh, offered a potential solution, which is if the soul is immaterial, why can't a single soul animate multiple bodies? So it may be that all of the incarnations of a given soul are resurrected and animated by the same soul. So <laughs> that was this morning in synagogue. And I think that were I to actually, you know, sort of relate this to, to many people, including many Jews, they might be surprised at the, that it's just such a given. In this community, that that, that that one believes in reincarnation. Uh, so the, the the topic of today is um, is the background to this. How, how did how did this come about? Um, that something that doesn't seem so intuitive from biblical and rabbinic literature came to be um, a universal belief among Jews who have not rejected Kabbalistic tradition have not rejected the tradition of Kabbalah in the encounter with modernity. So the, the Kabbalistic tradition became very dominant from the 16th century onwards. And, um, and basically, Jews who have not consciously pushed against that subscribe to belief in reincarnation. So today, we will look at the background to this. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there is no, there is no evidence of belief in reincarnation in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, despite what the proponents of reincarnation will, will say, because that there are many, many uh, biblical verses that are cited, and the same, I believe, in an Islamic context, one finds that the proponents of, of, uh, of metempsychosis pre uh, present very creative and very interesting readings of many scriptural verses. Um, unfortunately, for lack of time, we're not going to explore some of that exegesis because it really is fun. Um, and um, but uh, but we don't find clear sources. We don't find clear sources in in rabbinic uh, texts. Although there, there may be allusions, but there's nothing clear. Um, and the earliest clear but still indirect evidence for Jewish belief in metempsychosis we find in two 10th century authors. Um, may I ask? I, I don't. Is that sheet available? Ah, here we go. Okay. This is a very basic. In the absence of actual written sources that I that that I would give you, uh, what we have here is basically a sort of a timeline of really of key moments in the debate um, around, met around metempsychosis. And on the right, you can see some titles of works, the first an academic study, um, and the, the second two 
are more introductory. I would say the first is academically adjacent and the second is uh, from basically from within the tradition, within um, within the Kabbalistic tradition, but written for a lay audience. And, and I think that they are useful introductions to Jewish beliefs, both in the afterlife in general and specifically um, in metempsychosis. So our earliest sources, our earliest written sources are from the 10th century, but at least one of them pertains to an 8th century figure. So this is indirect evidence. These are not people professing belief in reincarnation. They're people who polemicize against reincarnation. Um, so the first that, that we'll discuss is actually the younger of the two, which is which is Jacob uh, Al-Kirkisani, who is uh, a 10th century Karaite figure. So he's a non-rabbinic Jew. He's a Jew who does not accept rabbinic authority. Um, and he, in his major work, Kitab al-Anwar wal-Marapib, the book of uh, lights and watchtowers, he ascribes belief in reincarnation to Anan ben David, who lives in 8th century Mesopotamia and promotes belief in reincarnation, it seems. Uh, he says that this is what the this is what is said of Anan, uh, and that he has encountered followers of Anan. Ben David, who um, who accepts belief in reincarnation. And what's very interesting about Al Kisani is that he gives a lot of detail about contemporaneous Jewish movements. He mentions all kinds of movements that we don't have other sources for, and he's the only the only Jewish figure who does this kind of almost heresiology. Um, and he actually calls all of the non rabbinic groups Karaites, um, and um, and he attests and really highlights explicitly the diversity of their views on all kinds of matters. Um, so in this particular case, he associates the belief in metempsychosis with one particular group among the Karaites. Anan ben David was, I think this is significant, that he was basically the most rabbinically learned of the non-rabbinic, of, of the uh, non-rabbinic Jewish leaders. Uh, he sort of broke away from the rabbinic establishment and uh, but his extant writings show very deep rabbinic learning, uh, so it's significant. It's interesting that in eight, that in the eighth century we have this figure apparently pro professing belief in reincarnation, and that there is a movement that follows in his wake. Um, Al Kirkisani polemicizes against it, and what he basically claims is that metempsychosis is intended to resolve a problem in theodicy. And it's the problem of the suffering of the innocent and especially the children. And he claims that it doesn't really resolve this problem. You know, no, no better than a more um, than a more classical biblical approach does. Um, that, in his understanding, reserves reward and punishment in the afterlife. Um, now, Saga Gaon, his younger contemporary, there are many fascinating parallels between them. And to, to the best of my knowledge, there's no direct, there's no evidence for for um, for their acquaintance with one another. But there are many fascinating parallels between them. And Saga Gaon does not refer to a specific group. I mean, he doesn't refer to a group by name, but he does refer. He says. Um, he says, I'll just read the line in Arabic so that we get a bit of the tone and then I'll read it in English. He refers to uh, a group. He says, uh, Let me say I've encountered a group who are considered to be Jews, who profess belief in recurrence, calling it tanasuch, succession or metempsychosis. That's the standard term for met metempsychosis. Um, and he calls this belief a waswas and tahlit, a delusion, insanity. <laughs> uh, so he's he's very judgmental about it. It's, it's a little judgy. Um, and uh, so from that, and, and he also adds that he wouldn't even bother responding were it not for the gullible. He says, I'm afraid that gullible people are going to actually accept belief in this. Otherwise, I wouldn't even bother responding because it's such... In his opinion, it is such a misguided uh, approach. And he attributes it, he, he does raise the, the problem of, the, of theodicy, um, but he raises two other problems, which is just a complete misunderstanding of psychology in the sense of, of the human soul 
and its nature and its origination and things like this. And, uh, and also to, um, to understandable errors born of observing human beings with, for example, animalistic qualities and things like this, that, one, that a soul may have acquired such, uh, such um, uh, dispositions from its previous lives as animals. Like this person was obviously a, um, you know, a, uh, a sloth. So, uh, I mean, I don't know that sloth is the best example, but it's just like, you know, in reference to, a, okay. So the, um, so anyway, so he's very dismissive of it. So they are sort of our, <clears throat> our early sources, our earliest sources attesting to any Jewish belief in metempsychosis that are clear, that are unambiguous. And now uh, we are going to travel to the Latin West. It is going to be a short ride. We are here. We're in the Latin West. And um, and in the 12th century, well, that, you know, a book that, that uh, circulates in the 12th century in Occitania uh, named Sefer Habahir, we find the first direct and unambiguous evidence for belief in metempsychosis. It's so direct and unambiguous that it's jarring. Because it simply it simply brings scriptural interpretations that assume belief in reincarnation. There's no sense of discomfort. There's no sense of there's nothing polemical about it. It's just that's that's how it is. That there is just reincarnation. It is simply assumed in a text that that presents in quite a classical rabbinic style. And I'll I'll read a, a short a short um um excerpt from it so f firstly there's there's an interpretation of the verse from ecclesiastes of ecclesiastes 1 4 a generation goes and a generation comes and in the name of rabbi akiva this is interpret interpreted as follows a generation comes that has already come that's it the generation that comes has already come and then they offer a parable to what may the matter be compared to a king who had servants and who dressed them insofar as possible in silk and embroidery. It's interesting, insofar as possible. It's a very interesting expression. I don't really understand what it's doing there, but okay. As far as possible in silk and embroidery. If they stepped out of line, he cast them down and pushed them away, removing his clothes from them, and they went away. He took the clothes and washed them well so that no impurity remained, and he kept them ready with him. He acquired new servants and clothed them in the same clothes, not knowing if those servants were worthy or not. Now had they now they had merited the clothes that had already come into the world and been worn previously, and the earth endures forever. This is as it is written, the dust returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. Um, the parallel, <coughs> sorry, the parable is a little confusing. The clothes laundered and reborn again and again represent the souls that are born and reborn while the servants represent the bodies i think this is counterintuitive uh, but that seems to be the straightforward meaning of the parable and there's a lot to unpack but for the present context i think that the that the main point is that according to the Bayer, souls are clearly reincarnated generation after generation after being cleansed and apportioned to new bodies um, so, so far, we have indirect evidence for Jewish belief in the 10th century, in primarily in Mesopotamia. Although Sadia Gaon was a real traveler, he was born he was born in Fayum in Egypt, and uh, and spent time in Palestine, in Eretz Israel, and then in and then in uh, uh, Mesopotamia, took up a, a very prestigious academic position, rabbinic position, um, heading uh, yeshiva there. Uh, uh, an academy of rabbinic learning um and but now we we have not too long after this maybe two centuries after we have direct evidence emerging in occitania of all places um now we'll return to the islamic world returning to ayubid egypt um i have to say one word about maimonides my every everything in jewish thought and history is going to be mapped in relation to Maimonides, it's just a fact. We have to accept it. He's born in 1138 and he dies in 1204, uh, born in uh, in Muslim Spain, um, in Cordoba, and uh, he flees the Almohads 
uh, in, via North Africa, uh, via, the, via the Levant, especially Palestine, to, um, to Egypt. He settles in Egypt and he becomes the dominant rabbinic figure of certainly of his generation and arguably of all time. <laughs> he's, he's really uh, incomparable. Now, he did not believe in reincarnation. He aligned himself very much with the peripatetic tradition or the neo-Aristotelian tradition. Um, there are various terms that are used for this tradition. It, it's the tradition of Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, uh, Ibn Badja. This is uh, a, a, an intellectual tradition that is very sort of distinctive. It has its own literary corpus. And, uh, and despite uh, some interesting things in the theology of Aristotle, which everybody's reading, which is actually uh, um, reworked Plotinus's Enneads, despite the fact that they're all reading that as well, nobody really accepts reincarnation in that, accepts belief in mental psychosis in that, in that context, in that intellectual tradition. Um, so, however, his son feels a need, once again, so this is Abraham Maimonides, who was born in, is he up there, 1186 and dies in 1237. See, the dates for my, my for his father, you know, you can pull out, but for him, one has to look at a, at a written text, it's shameful. Uh, 1138 to 1204, oh, sorry, that's his father, 1186 to 1237, and he, no, I wrote that Maimonides opposes. To the best of my knowledge, he doesn't directly polemicize, but his son does in his major work, which is which is called Kitab Kifayat al Abidin, the Sufficient Guide for the Servants of God. Um, he uh, polemicizes against um, against belief in reincarnation, and his argument is exactly is is that of Ibn Sina, basically. So Ibn Sina in the 11th century makes an argument that however one views a soul coming into a new body that pre-existed, it is going to be logically absurd. Not logically, it's going to be scientifically impossible, right? Because you, either you're going to have a soul with no body into which a soul comes, or you're going to have a soul, a body that comes into being with a soul. So there can be no body that generates without a soul. So or you're going to have two souls in a single body, and that's clearly absurd. Right. That's his, basically his, argu his argument. And this is embraced by Abraham, uh, the son of Moses Maimonides, and uh, in a section of his major work, which is no longer extant, but fortunately it is cited in a 16th century thinker that we're going to discuss right at the end, but um, who translates it into Hebrew. And he refers to two other sections that he translated into Hebrew in other works of his, but they're not extant, which is very unfortunate. What are you going to do? This is this is life. Can't always get what you want. So the um, so yeah, who's next in line? Um, so that's his his argument. Oh, well, let's ask why would he raise if Maimonides didn't feel the need to polemicize against this belief? If Sadia Gaon opposed it, and for the most part in the Islamic world, we don't see Jews embracing belief in metempsychosis. Why would Maimonides' son feel the need to polemicize? And I think, uh, and I thank Idawan for conversations on this topic, um, I think that there is enough context to imagine that this is a belief that he encountered among uh, both among Muslims and among Jews. So firstly, we know that, um, that the works of, um, uh, of uh, Suhra Wardi al-Maqtul, the, uh, the founder of the Illuminationist, School of Philosophy, who died in 1191, who was executed in 1191, uh, that he, in his major work, despite the fact that in other works he polemicizes against it, in his major work, he seems very sympathetic towards belief in metempsychosis, and many of his followers embrace belief in meta metempsychosis, or at least interpret him that way. And um, the second point is that there is evidence of Jewish migration from Western Europe into Egypt in this period. And, um, and now if we know that around this time, a little earlier, that Sefer Bahir is, is that the, the Bahir is circulating in Occitania, Jews from Western Europe may embrace such beliefs. That's possible. Um, the... And Jews are also engaging. We know that Jews are engaging with illuminationist literature and Sufi literature. And among Sufis, there's also this diversity of attitudes towards metempsychosis. 
So, and we know that Jews are, are both have both have living direct interactions with Sufis, and that they're consuming Sufi literature. And I say we know because there are there are uh, manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza of these texts in Hebrew script, and there are also correspondences that are preserved that attest to Jewish uh, participation in um, all kinds of aspects of Sufi life. So basically, it seems that there is a context for this polemic that makes sense. There's a, there's a context for this polemic that we can imagine where Abraham Maimonides is once again encountering metempsychosis as a, as a viable belief, as a, poss as a possible belief among the Jews that he, that he has contact with. Um, the next, now I've decided to, to go, to, to go, um, uh, chronologically, even though it means that we're traveling back and forth across the, the Mediterranean. So I apologize if uh, people experience travel sickness, but now we're back in Christian Spain and we have our second piece of direct evidence for belief in, um, in um, metempsychosis among Jews. And this is once again, a text which, which assumes belief, which presents belief in metempsychosis as, as a given and just interprets versus interprets or presents interpretations that just assume metempsychosis as an underlying belief. So for example, in the Zohar on Genesis 38.8, um, the we read as follow as follows. As long as the holy soul is within him, a person should expand. Oh, by the way, this is Daniel Matt's translation. From the Pritzker Zohar, volume three, page 137. As long as the holy soul is within him, a person should expand the image of the supernal king in the world by having children. So what this, this is referring to an, an ancient rabbinic interpretation that a person who does not have children who does not have children uh, diminishes the divine image. Human beings are created in the, in the divine image. The more human the more divine image in the world, the, the less human, the less divine image in the world. So the Zohar assumes familiar, familiarity with this and says, as long as the holy soul is within him, a person should expand the image of the supernal king in the world. Whenever a person is unsuccessful in this world, the blessed holy one uproots him and replants him several times as before. So people who don't who don't have children are born and reborn and reborn so that they have opportunities to increase the divine image in the world. Uh, so that's from the Zohar. Now the Tikkuni Zohar, which is a sort of a later stratum of the work, uh, develops a more complex view of this doctrine, um, and um, and that will be further developed in the later in the later Kabbalistic tradition. Um, now we're, we're going to get back into our spatio-temporal teleportation unit and go back and, and uh, return to the Islamic world, where we actually find the first citations now in the late 14th century. We, we encounter the first direct citations of the Zohar and the Bakir in a Judeo-Arabic writer. And so a writer who's writing in Arabic and Hebrew script for a Jewish audience, and he is clearly reading the Zohar, reading the Bakir, citing from them, and that is David ben Yehoshua ibn Maimun, Maimonides, who is the last known descendant of Mo Moses Maimonides. He's the last known descendant of Moses Maimonides. He's the last in the Maimonides dynasty to hold the position of Nagid or Ra'is al-Yahud, basically chief rabbi of the empire. Um, and uh, he's in Mamluk, Egypt, and spends some time living in Syria, both in Halab and in Damascus, in Aleppo and Damascus. Um, now, despite his uh, positive citations of the, of the Zohar and the Bahir, um, and despite his generally positive attitude towards these works, he cites them approvingly, he does not accept belief in metempsychosis. Uh, but his, his opposition is much more moderate than Sadia's. His tone is much more respectful. He, um, after defining the term, he presents a typical adversarial argument that two souls cannot inhabit, cannot inhabit a single body. 
as we know, the body can't into, come into being and develop without a soul. He adds the disembodied soul needs a locus within which to dwell in the world. And finally, that the unique composition or commixture, the mizaj of each body demands the presence of a unique soul for that body. That's actually a very nice one. That every that every body, in so far as it is physically unique, has to have a unique soul, has to be animated by a unique soul. Um, David ben Yeshua then presents his own argumentation for a peripatetic understanding of the survival of the soul after the death of the body, uh, which is obviously beyond the scope of, of today's discussion. Um, I'll just say one word about this, this idea that this relationship between body and soul in the peripatetic tradition, in general, what is the dominant position, um, is that correct to say that? Okay. So the soul is either viewed, no, it's generally the soul, I'm sorry. The soul is viewed as a as a an intellect, a perfection of the body. I think a helpful parallel to this is uh, is if we think about contemporary philosophy of mind, and people talk about consciousness as an emergent property of the physical brain, right? Um, and uh, so we can think of of the soul as an emergent property of an organism, of a living organism, right? This is um, this is a living functioning organism. Now, this in this understanding, the organism dies, apparently the soul would die, right? So for, for a lot of, um, of the peripatetics, what's most important is to attain intellectual realization, to attain a level of consciousness that transcends the individual self in some way that that makes some that touches the active intellect which governs the sublunar world so that's the cosmology and and that that mode of consciousness that sort of transcends the individual that's called the acquired intellect that's al uh, al mustafad is that correct al al mustafad is the the acquired intellect in hebrew it's known as hasekhel hanikne the acquired intellect and um, so that's what survives after death. For Maimonides, it's very clear, well, not very clear, but it's fairly clear that that's an impersonal afterlife. That's an impersonal afterlife. One loses the boundaries of the individual self, but some stratum of one's consciousness, which transcends the individual, persists. Um, that's the sort of thing that sits in the background to David ben Yoshua. Um, and that's the tradition that he aligns with. Uh, metempsychosis doesn't make sense in that tradition, right? It's not the soul doesn't trap. The soul isn't a being that travels through the cosmos that has an independent life. Um, so, so yeah. So I so I think I think that it's although he doesn't refer explicitly to the Bahir and the Zohar in his context. Um, David ben Yoshua, I believe, is responding to his exposure to these teachings in the Bahir and in the Zohar, which he clearly knows directly. Um, now, now our, the, fin the final uh, chapter occurs in the 16th century, and I'll start with opposition. The opposition that we find is in, the, is in a work by a character named Ab Abraham Halevi ibn Migash. Now, um, people might recognize that this is Maimonides' father's teacher. No, 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 sorry, Ibn Migashi is the name of Maimonides' father's teacher. This is apparently a direct descendant of, uh, of uh, the famous Rimigash, who turns up in the Ottoman Empire, I mean, obviously in the 16th century, there are many, many generations removed. And uh, he completed his only extant work. Oh, he was a physician to the Sultan uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, and he settled in Damascus. And in 1585, he completed his only extant work, Kevod Elohim, Divine Glory, in which he explain, explores a, a broad range of theological and philosophical themes, including metempsychosis, which he rejects. But he knows that he is the last man standing. Uh, and the way that he frames it is this. Since this is in the 10th chapter of that, of that work, his only published work, and to the best of my knowledge, his only extant work, since long ago, an error has befallen most of our nation, most of our nation. 
and their opinion has tended towards belief in metempsychosis, Gilgul Hanefesh, and they believe it. They believe it as if it were one of the foundations of the Torah. Now here we can feel a shift, and we can feel the trajectory from metempsychosis from the margins of Jewish belief to clear dominance. He's living in the Levant in the 16th century, which is a period when Kabbalah is enjoying its most glorious and creative period. It's in this period that the great systematizers of Spanish Kabbalah emerge in precisely the same geographic region that he's living in. Moses Cordovero, who dies in 1570, and Isaac Luria, known as the Ari or Ari HaKadosh. It's an acronym uh, which means the Holy Lion. He dies in 1572. Luria was a mystic and, and thinker of particularly unique depth and originality. And based partly on Tikkun Zohar, he developed an elaborate theory of transmigration, locating all human souls in relation to the primordial soul of Adam. In the Lurianic system, the purpose of each individual soul is to attain its highest perfection, which contributes to the, ongo the ongoing project of cosmic reparation, including the reparation of the Godhead damaged in a primordial cataclysm. Different kinds of souls have different challenges in attaining their ultimate perfection. Some must strive for longer periods. Some attain it more easily, um, and others must. Some may, most must go further incarnations. Um, these teachings regarding metempsychosis not only form the basis for the individual self conception of Luria and the members of his circle, his disciples, but they shaped shaped Lurianic. Um, ascetic practices and ritual life. And actually that, that book, Sleep, Death and Rebirth, is a, is a wonderful exploration of the relationship between um, belief in metempsychosis and the specific dynamics of the, how that's understood in the, in the life of religious praxis. How's it actually manifested in the lives of Luria and his disciples? Um, <clears throat> it's also notable that um, Firstly, that fragmenting the soul and different, part, different parts of the soul having their own trajectory in their own life makes sense for Luria. That's something which is a possibility. And secondly, that based on the Zohar, they adopt um, an idea which is called Ibur, which means, um, which means impreg uh, impregnation, pregnancy, or gestation. And it's the idea that another soul, or at least part of another soul, can inhabit uh, can can uh, together with the primary soul can inhabit um, a body with, together with its primary soul. So this is this is being described by uh, by Simcha Paul Raphael in his book Jewish Views of the Afterlife as benign possession, benign possession. Um, and um, what's interesting, I think, to to me in this in this case is that it seems to be an internalization. Of the Avicenna critique, but the Avicenna critique is it's absurd to have multiple souls in a single body, and they say well, why? <laughs> you could have multiple souls in in uh, in a single body. That's fine. Um, I think also if we look at the underlying ontology, that tells us something about why it can make sense. So rather than having a soul as uh, as an emergent property of a physical organism, what you have is uh, the physical world as an enclosement as a presentation of divine light hidden behind countless veils, enclosed in forms. It's a totally different world intellectually, right? And 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 it, and it's a lot more flexible in how we can think about souls and their trajectory. Um, so basically, in the 16th century, we see a total shift, and we really see the victory of um, of this intellectual tradition of the Luria of the Kabbalistic tradition as interpreted and, and systematized, I mean, following the Zohar as interpreted and, and systematized in the 16th century by Cordovero and, and especially Luria, and then that, that really uh, dominates. I'd like to finish with a, just a remarkable passage from Luria's closest disciple. Luria himself wrote very little. But his, he, and we know of his teachings through his disciples, and especially through uh, Chaim Vital, 
who um, who was sort of his his dominant disciple, um, certainly. And in the second twenty second chapter of this Shar Hagil Gulim, which treats uh, reincarnation, um, he writes as follows: Many times have I been in the company of my teacher of blessed memory, walking in the field, and he would say to me. There was a a man named so-and-so, a righteous man and a disciple of the sages. And due to such and such a transgression that he committed in his life, he's come to be reincarnated in this stone or in that plant and so on. Now, my teacher had never known this person, but we would investigate the deceased person that he'd named and find his words to be honest and true. And one shouldn't elaborate on such matters for even an entire book would not suffice. (laughs) <laughs> that was fantastic the 